what you guys don't want to hear the 50 email beeps i'm gonna probably get in this in this <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And we are once again on top of the Ford Experience uh, Raptor trailer uh, here at UTV Takeover. Today we're in Utah, San Hollow, Utah. It's pretty pretty awesome uh, out here. I've never been to a place like this. How about you? Uh, no. I, I the, No. <laughs> no. Looks like Mars. It does a little bit. The red sands out here are pretty epic. Um, we're joined today by some pretty epic guests. We're going to be out here all week. Uh, talking to people and whatnot, but uh, today we got some uh, pretty special guys doing some pretty special stuff at the uh, at the event. Yeah, ex- super excited. You guys are gonna get a little gnarly this week. Uh, I, they've been hearing some stories about where you guys are headed after this, and uh, kind of want to follow you out there and get it on camera. That's for sure. <laughs> so we got uh, the one and the only uh, that can possibly be Al Macbeth. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we have Brandon Raddick. His uh, I guess the mini me, <laughs> <laughs> the twelve o'clock wheelie champ. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, uh, Brandon, you were out at uh, Oregon, uh, throwing down at Wheelie Fest out there, new world record, huh? Yeah, pretty soaked on that, two hundred and sixty-three feet. Pretty epic, and uh, we we got the footage of that. It was pretty pretty awesome to see. Al, you were supposed to be there. What uh, what happened there? Well, uh, our uh, our border is kind of kind of screwed us up on that one. Um, once I got back from Oklahoma, they put me into a fourteen day quarantine, and I just wasn't able to get across, unfortunately, to the event. So, if I had, I, I was pretty much getting out of quarantine on the Saturday of the event. But if I had um, gone across then i would have missed this event fully so gotcha. uh, we were we talked to coordinators and they were like you know what we might as well just let's do this one right and you had to pick one of them right yeah, so. had to pick one of them you well, know i i've got about 500 acres at my place i could just build like a mini Macbeth co- compound <laughs> so i'm just, totally it's gonna in. be a problem you can just pull <laughs> up and just take some real estate <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm totally in and that was one of the that was one of, when, when i was coming back from oklahoma i'm like do i just hang down here for a few weeks and yeah. just not go back you know <laughs> but didn't have quite enough gear and still got a business to run up 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 north so uh yeah we we waited to get back right so uh you know those that know you know you from your world record uh, long jumps, Al. Um, you know, kind of give some backstory on who you are, where you came from, um, kind of the the man behind the scenes there that we don't know about. Um, geez, I don't even I don't, I don't even know if you want to know that. <laughs> 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 no, I started uh, I started like a lot of guys. Um, well, uh, you know, started with a go kart when I was a kid. Uh, go karts turned into dirt bikes. Uh, dirt bikes turned into racing. Uh, racing then turned into freestyle motocross. We had a real good run, uh, about 10 years doing that. Um, always loved jumping. And then uh, in uh, 2008, nine, when Polaris Razor came out, um, our, our whole freestyle crew was pretty beat up at that point and, you know, injuries and just we're, we're not getting any younger. And uh, I jumped in my, ra- uh, for my first Razor, it was a little 800 and uh, was had that thing airborne within about five minutes. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I knew life had just changed, you know, um, it, it, it was it was pretty apparent how capable I, I could see the capabilities of these things. So um, then started racing them and then started breaking stuff and we started racing them. So then uh, started a business concept distributing um, and we just build aftermarket roll cages, all, all the safety components for them and then distribute for our other manufacturers as well. And um, with the company, you need a little more exposure and we were winning a lot of races, but um, you know, back to my airtime, my, my airtime love and uh, we got uh, we started jumping, and then we started tweaking, tuning, jumping, jumping, building ramps, and then all of a sudden a record came into 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 the picture, and then we've never really looked back since. Was that something that you actually identified and went after, or was <clears> it just something that happened and you're like, oh, I guess I hold that record now? No, we we were we were definitely going after it. Um, RJ RJ was kind of playing this game same game down here, and um, I was like, all right, I was like, uh, let's let, let's do this. Um, I had it when when he. When he set a record, you know, I already had a compound with freestyle ramps in it, and I was like, "Oh, I was like, we can play that game." <laughs> so then that's kind of how it that's kind of how it all began. But you know, it's like uh, adrenaline's a pretty addicting drug, you know. And uh, for myself, anyway, I'm always looking to go bigger and bigger or, or get things better and better. It's a little noisy in the background. 
<laughs> yeah, it is. It's an event, right? We're, yeah. at a, we're at a trade show, essentially, and there's going to be people and cars coming in and out. And last time we were up on top of here, we had trains cutting through our show. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so I've actually been on site at the compound. Like, I, I was trying to get a hold of Al. We are going to do some, uh, some battery stuff, and I showed up there. And uh, I didn't know what to expect or anything like that. But when I showed up there, there was these two dudes that were outside of the garage there. And I'm just thinking to myself, if I was in America right now, there'd be shotguns pointed. At me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like it's a, that place is so legit, man. You, you want to talk about that a little bit, kind of what you got set up there for uh, testing and practice? And- yeah. So, so again, that's that's my property. That's that's where I live. And um, we just uh, I bought an acreage, and uh, testing is the number one key to, to success honestly and uh, so we we started building we got ramp jumps we, we, we have we have a, a test for every section we've got whoop sections we got rollers we got ramps we got dirt jumps we got we got everything that can test all types of, of suspension and and speed and all that kind of stuff so uh, it that don't not only goes for my own stuff but we also test customers cars when we you know do something for them so that they can we can prove to them right there hey this is this is what it was before this is what it is now yeah. Um but yeah, ramp wise, uh, we just I, I do a lot of uh, I, I do a lot of uh, testing and tuning, obviously on suspension, and um, a lot of data is always getting recorded. And so you know when I'm when I'm out hitting, I, I've got certain ramps that I hit, and I know what they what what happens, and we video and then go do a tune and hit it again, and oh, okay, now this is happening. So we're the, we're, we're we're either on the right track or we're on the wrong track. So. Right. And you get, you've talked a number of times about collecting data and figuring out the numbers and all that kind of stuff. Kind of give the listeners an idea of kind of how you collect numbers and how you utilize those numbers. Um, <clears throat> well, a lot of, I mean, we live in a golden age, honestly. There's a lot of uh, technology uh, involved. Uh, can't give away all the secrets, right, but right. It, like, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, using videos, using GoPros, um, Oh, um, you know, you're watching speeds, you're watching RPM, stuff like that, um, and just gathering data, gathering distances, gathering angles, um, you know, uh, and and heights, and it all goes into this big uh, this big spreadsheet I got, and and you start making notes, and then all of a sudden your your spreadsheet turns into a book, and all of a sudden you know you got two books, and it's like wow, we got a lot of data now, and right. so you know you go out to an event like this, you take some measurements, you. Uh, you uh, look. You look at, the, at your surrounding area that you got to work with, and then you scroll through your book. You look at, <clears throat> or sometimes it's in the head. But uh, I, I, I like uh, trusting my my notes sometimes more than my brain. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, you, you you pick out the setup that that you've you know hopefully done something similar to to in the past, and you go for it. Yeah. We've talked with uh, Hubert Rowland in the past, who is uh, from Nitro Circus, right? And he's one of their ramp builders, and and he was saying, you know, you basically get to a point where you walk up to a section, a ramp, or a, a kicker, or something, and you know exactly how each vehicle is going to handle off that. Is that kind of where you're at now? Is it you can kind of feel it before you're even <clears throat> on it? Yeah, you, you you start getting a pretty good vibe for for what's going on, what's right, what's wrong. I mean, there's always some wild cards out there, right? That's that's what does make this you know exciting. Nothing's ever exactly the same. I mean, I'm I'm looking at a place like this. We've got a we've got a sand that I've never really been in, you know. So we've got a new we've got a new sand element now. We're gonna have to deal with. I don't know how uh, how the traction is gonna go. I don't know how the car is gonna fly in this type of sand. We also don't know now that we're you know at this point we're manufacturing jumps in the sand type deal. Um, we're seeing how the dozers even working out here. It's it's I'm already seeing that we're gonna have a little bit of an issue with uh, getting some faces. Uh, proper for you know launching launching a, a, ra- a ramp at these speeds yeah so just um, as no moisture factor <clears throat> yeah there ain't there ain't no moisture out here <laughs> yeah i've noticed it sounds a little different than what we're used to riding on from the standpoint that like uh i feel like i'm herding the car almost like it's almost like a jet ski where you're starting to set your set your turn so much earlier than you would in oregon like oregon for me is like real point and shoot and out here is like i'll go into a corner and you start drifting maybe like 15 to 20 yards before you get into it. And then everything just kind of, yeah, it is a different sand, that's for sure. It feels very loose. Feels like there's areas too. where you can see where no one's been on and it, it feels firm on top, but as soon as you step on it, like you get your weight onto it, then you start sinking, right? So um, how does that change your approach to thinking about 
uh, the takeoff? I mean, the landing is its own thing, but as far as taking off, how does that affect your approach speed or your, <clears throat> maybe your suspension on the front end? Or well, we're, we're going to do a little we're going to do a little testing on that before we actually hit it. You know, um, my, one of my concerns, and, and 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 when you're building sand jumps, that's we, we, we actually got it kind of dialed in in Oklahoma, we thought, but again, that was for Oklahoma sand. Um, it's not like dirt. You can't pack it. It doesn't, it just kind of flows away. And then you add like a big heavy piece of equipment to the, to the situation. And um, that throws a wild card into it as well. So I'm not sure how we're going to be able to pack this face to get the angles that we want. Um, what you don't want and what, you know, is, is a fairly common thing is you don't want to leave a face fluffy and then hit it because nine times out of ten one of those wheels is going to drop and the other is going to stay up and then you're flying through the air sideways and then you know what happens after that so yeah right and you got a little squirrely on the last one over in oklahoma <coughs> but you uh, managed to save it and i'm thinking that's because it was a little bit tacky as far as the grip that you might you might have had on the landing uh, as opposed to out here where you might just sink in and, and it might just grab you and throw you um <coughs> I don't know if I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that we saved it because of the tacky. I think we saved it because of the. <laughs> we, we we've been. It hasn't been the first time I've ever been on two wheels. No, there honestly. was definitely <laughs> skill involved there. But um, but the the I th I'm thinking looking back, looking at the videos. You know, the the reasoning for that was honestly it was we we had more guys hitting that jump than should have been hitting it. Um, the jump was starting to get pounded out, and one of the sides um, was getting a little bit lower than the other. And I'm gonna attribute that to you know what happened like we should have when you get into gaps that big it gets i've i've even got to take a take a step back you, you get into the moment you're just i'm just gonna hit it i'm just gonna hit it um so much can go wrong and it can go so bad at distances like this when you're literally you're, you're three four seconds in the air just flying um you know you're one degree off on on, on a back wheel as you as you leave um, that one degree is going to get amplified to 20 degrees by the time you land so that was what happened you know the, the back of the car kicked out a bit it could have even uh, there was some wind that kicked up that day it could have been a bit of a factor um but yeah again happy that car is a monster it can withstand a lot of uh, a lot of not perfect situations and pull out of it, and, and, and I'm going to say that's the reason that we didn't go tumbling. Well, it looks like at gaps like that too. There are some variables that are really, really hard to account for because coming off of it, you were flying great, but you're in the air so long, yeah. you were starting to drift passenger a little bit towards the end there as yeah. well, and it's just. I guess that's that's just a reality of being up in the air for three to five seconds. <laughs> so, it, it is, and like yeah, yeah like when, when we were doing the ramp, like like the ramp jumps. That's why you know, and that's why this is getting kind of crazy because it's it's a bit cowboy out in the dunes because you're you know there isn't that perfection like we have with the ramps. And you know when I'm setting up a ramp, I mean there's we got levels levels and gauges and everything on everything, making sure it's perfect. You know, yeah. so that when you get out there, you're still still. You have your best uh, chance to be in form anyway, you know, and that everything comes down to tire pressures. And you could you could attribute stuff to uh, a paddle as you're leaving the face, grabbing a little bit more on one side and throwing you off, you yeah. know. Yeah. So right. many variables to jumping in the sand. For sure, for sure. So I want to get into uh, Medusa a little bit and just kind of give an overview to those that aren't familiar with that car. But, uh, Brandon, uh, let's get a little bit of your backstory. Where, where are you from and, and how did you get to this point? And you know, I'm from uh, Leavenworth, Washington, small little mountain town. Uh, I bought a 16 Razor and was watching people like Al here doing big things <laughs> and uh, really decided I wanted a piece of that. And if I, if I wanted in on it, I was going to have to do things that other people weren't doing. You, you've got a moto background as well, like uh, bikes, sleds, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. I grew up uh, doing pretty much mostly extreme sports. I was a semi-professional snowboarder for a while. Uh, I got really, really good at that, and I kind of I blew my knee out. And so I picked up snowmobiling because I couldn't ride my board any longer. Uh, and then it just kind of kept progressing from there. I've uh, rode dirt bikes my whole life, same thing, freestyle jumping and, and a lot of dune riding. So the dunes came right in for me with the Razor immediately. And uh, <clears throat> I had some good horsepower, decent at the time for 2016. So I was able to start doing stuff that other people weren't doing, like water crossings and wheelies and starting to watch this guy and learn how to jump and see where the, the actual technique in it was versus just hitting the gas and sending your car for a ride. Yeah. So, uh, Al, you know, you're, you've kind of 
I don't want to say you were like the originator of a big jump, right? There, but you've kind of pioneered the UTV jumping stuff along with people like RJ and, and some of those other sponsored guys. Um, you know, what? How does that? Uh, how? How is that looking at like an industry that's trying to then kind of match you and follow you in your footsteps on what you're doing from an OE standpoint? Even like they're coming out with these crazy cars now, right? That you know, back in the day we had eight, 10, 12 inches of travel. And nowadays we're up to two feet, you know, straight from the factory. Um, not saying that they're perfect shock or anything, but um, how, like kind of what's your perspective on like how the industry is progressing into this and, and enabling people like Brandon to kind of pr- pursue those passions and, and follow those dreams? It's rad. I mean, seeing the Polar- Polaris has had, you know, such a market share for so long and now other, other companies are coming out and, uh, and the competition has begun you know and to see what it's coming out with oem is 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 mind-blowing like honestly like uh, the the players is new pro like that is such a badass car out of the box um it's yeah man i i love where it's going i mean i'll always i'll always do my an an oem can only do so much i mean that that's that's the one thing um you know so they're always be tweaking and tuning and to get to the to the next level absolutely but um hey with with yeah with competition comes cool products and and it's it's all honestly it's a golden age to be alive just that we can we we have even a, a a a base to work off of like what the oems are giving us yeah, I, I've kind of always said racing drives innovation, and that was always true in motocross. And it just seems like looking back at like a 2008 RZR or something like that is almost like looking at like a 1974 Elsinore 250. You know? <laughs> right, and yeah. it's like, I mean, it's come so fast, come along so fast. It just, you know, when I when I got sold on UTV it was actually that XP, that first XP1. And uh, we were out at Hungry Valley, California and ripping through in my, in my brother-in-law's, and I was on my RMZ 450. And I go, dude, you just bought a twenty thousand dollar trophy truck. I'm like, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> like this is sick. <laughs> so you know, when we talk about doing uh, big jumps and everything, and kind of to lead into you know, the car that you've built, um, you know, what's kind of the major uh, technology advancement that's kind of enabled all this kind of craziness? Is it is it the the cars, the engines, the trannies, the suspension? I would assume it's mostly suspension. It it is all of it, honestly. Uh, you gotta. Y- you got to have something that puts out power. Um, you got to have suspension that works. You got to have shocks that work. You got to have something that's safe. Um, you'll you'll see, you'll hear me pushing the safety factor over and over again because that is the the biggest component of what we're doing. The last thing you want is to someone to jump in an OE car and go try to do something that they're for one their car is incapable of, or for two what they're not capable yeah. of. Um, I think. Uh, obviously shocks have a lot to do with it you know that, that's going to take some compression but the technology in shocks now is getting so great you know now we're, we've got long long travel kits factory we've got you know all all this kind of stuff um obviously my own car um safety is the highest uh the, the highest uh what a word i'm looking for priority priority <laughs> thank you <laughs> and um you know uh medusa is a full chassis just because i've you know i've taken some big tumbles in the past and i know what happens in those tumbles and so um uh, yeah other than that um shock angles have been corrected uh you know suspension has been triple triple bolted <laughs> on <laughs> um anything that in anything that we've had you know in the past fail has been upgraded on the car and um it works it works very well so <clears throat> when we talk about um, the, the components of the car, uh, how important is having um, big power or re- more responsive power or, or something like that? I mean, basically people assume you just go as fast as you possibly can and huck it off the j- end of the jump. I mean, we got to talk about the ability to torque the, the wheels in the midair and things like that. How, how does that change the approach to the motor and the trans and all that? Yeah, so... Um uh, yeah. Are you just throwing the biggest turbo on there possible and, and going no. all bore with 500 horsepower? No, not at all. It's, it's got to be it's got to be power, but it's got to be usable power. Um, another reason that you you need power is not every uh, not every run in, um, not every situation is perfect. So I mean, 
uh, UTV Takeover has done such a good job. I mean, as I said, back in the freestyle days, like we used to run events and the event coordinators, everything, something was always wrong. You know, it was just like, it, was, it would get so frustrating. You'd be at these events and you're, they'd, they'd have the ramp or there wouldn't be enough run in and you just have to, you know, that's how everyone ended up getting hurt was because, you know, you, you, you weren't comfortable with the situation. UTV Takeover always makes sure that the situation is to the best of their ability at least and, and these guys really bend over backwards around here for us so uh, pr huge props to them uh, but say you have a situation where you don't have quite the run in or 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 there's another factor that you know you just the, the hell of the sand that, that's a you know prime example this weekend the sand is going to rob more power than oregon sand so you're going to need some more power to get there now um you don't, can't you can't just be pinned off a jump that doesn't work in a utv either so if you can't get your speed um before a certain a certain say uh zone <clears throat> then you're coming into the jump at the wrong torque and you've you've, you've got a disaster on your hands before you even left the lip you know so having the heaven and having the power there is definitely uh definitely nice um, having too much power is a whole other world of trouble. <laughs> you, almost have to, you almost have to manage it. It's almost a, a nuisance then. You, you, you do. And, and when I um, <clears throat> when I started working with DW, um, got some, you know, big power put in Medusa because I was, I was a little, I was like, ah, power, power, power. You know, we need it more. Um, it's, it's, it was a learning curve. You know, I, I, I can, that car, when I'm, when I'm at, at a full tune, I can gain 10 miles an hour on the throttle by, by, by a bump. Like it doesn't even it, it doesn't even make sense how fast the car is, so that can change your your fly distance um, greatly. Yeah. And, and and I've had it happen at my compound even just you know going out a jump that I just normally know and normally give a little bump on the a little bump in a certain section of the ramp, and all of a sudden that bump launched me over my landing and onto a flat land yeah. and i'm just like holy shit what just happened there I go back look at the gopros and i'm like how was i doing that like yeah. it was insane so yeah uh, you don't want too much power <laughs> well i've seen you rip that thing in uh on oregon sand before and you know obviously it's a head turner and you know you know it's not stock but it was at sturgis it was at sturgis south dakota when you were ripping around and i'm going that thing's not of this world i'm like good <laughs> god <laughs> yeah. how much uh how much power are you running typically these days on that you know you've talked about go trying big power and all that but uh are you are you in that like two to three hundred range or are you in yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's 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 we're between there that, that that's kind of the wow. that, those are the kind of the tunes we play with um, and you know what you know what's funny <clears throat> in Sturgis, I, I kind of Sturgis was a bit of a was a bit of a shit show, lack of better terms, right? But um, it uh, we ended up coming up short on that jump, and that was actually uh, it had to pl into play. We, we had a few things into play. We had a we had a couple degrees off. We had a, a a ramp angle that was a couple, or sorry, the ramp angle was a couple degrees off. We had a height of a landing that was a couple feet off, and we tried to tone the tune down a little bit. And it was something that I wasn't used to because I'd now been used to working with this big power, and so my you know my throttle bop didn't quite work. And so you added those three factors and. We came up a foot short, you know, hey, and so it. Uh, and FYI, in my laptop sitting over there, I have an unreleased video of that. <laughs> that I had, I had the best seat in the house for that too. So I'll give. It, oh, I'll nice. give I never released it. I'll give it to you as soon as we're done there. Cool, it, it was, cool. Uh, it was, it, it's a pretty it good right perspective there. of. Uh, well, what well, it was funny. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it wasn't funny, you know, it, when when it happened. I, I'm I've got the I've got the camera rolling, and you know, I killed it pretty early, and dudes are just freaking out, just like like people do they're just like get in there get in there i'm like dude it's al he's fine man he's, just pissed. <laughs> <laughs> he's strapped in and upset yeah yeah so i got a question for brandon uh 260 plus feet had you not been concerned for the safety of the crowd how far would that wheelie have been <laughs> i honestly i think i could have ran it all the way to that back hill i think so too i no thought problem. you were going to yeah so I, did i had yeah. i not been so worried about running somebody over well, I you mean, hit 12 o'clock, and it looked like, I mean, it's like, okay, he's comfortable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he could be yeah. there a while. Yeah, I, I love doing wheelies. Um, I spend a lot of time practicing those. Uh, once I think once you learn how to actually do a wheelie and not just pull your front end up and chase it for a second, once you can actually get a 12 o'clock and ride it, it's just as addicting as big air jumping yeah we got, i mean there's nothing like it well you don't have to sell me on it because i've always told people like <laughs> I, I got race buddies and stuff i'm like do you know how to wheelie and they're like no i'm like all right here come on out and i've taught a couple guys how to do it and they're like 
Yeah, that's all I want to do now. I'm like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, you it. still need to get out and get some footage oh, together. I know, man. Side I, side I need leaders. to learn how to ride them better. I'm still, I'm still working up to it. But Mo- most people get scared of that <laughs> wheelie position, right? On a dirt bike, a motorcycle, all of it. You have that line where yeah. you're in that balance point where you don't have to be on the throttle so much. Yeah. And most people get scared of the side by side once it actually gets to that point, and they let out. You see so, it, see it all the time. So well, we saw what happens last time at Oregon. You know, yeah. when when the bumper catches and throws your wheels out from underneath you. Yeah, yeah. You definitely don't want a bumper that sticks out too far behind your car because it can lift your rear tires off the ground if you come down yeah. on it. Yeah. So power is nice with wheelies, but it's all technique. Like I, I've I've done a couple where people are like, how much power do you need to do that? I'm like, dude, you could do that stock. Yep. You know, all day, no problem. I've but done it in NA cars. Exactly. You, you I, can't I did hold one of my yeah, as far. Yeah, I did one of my YX. I had few in my YX the NA, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm doing it at my X3 right now, which is you know give or take somewhere between about 170, 180 wheel horsepower with with the tuning that's been done to it, and. I hopped into, you know, I was thinking in my back of my head I'll be able to do it easier with some more power. But, uh, like, I hopped into one of my buddies uh, down here at Superior. Uh, they have an X3 that they've been doing some tuning on, and it's putting about 280 to the wheels. Ooh. So doing a doing a 100-horsepower jump and then trying to trying to do some wheelies on I'm like, oh, man, if I disrespect this thing, we're going over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when that uh, you get too big of a turbo, too much power, and it kicks in when, like, <laughs> like what Al was saying with the jumping, you know, you just barely tapping it, think you're getting what you want, and you're getting a whole lot more than what you want. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not as controllable. It, with especially the big, when big there's power. no lag and it's coming on right now. Yeah. Right. So when we talk about throttle control, um, you know, when we talk about wheelies versus hucking, you know, do you have control over your throttle response? Can you set how fast that ramps up? And then how do you kind of approach that? Do you want as much as you can at a tap or do you want to have some more mid range to it? No, I, I want, <clears throat> I want responsive. Like, like, you know, you definitely, I don't I want, I want to, if I'm touching that gas, I mean, I want it there as soon as you can, obviously, uh, different machine or, or different machines it's going to have different lag but that you know I'm, I'm comfortable with that machine and what kind of lag it's got and and because it's always going to have a little bit with the turbo obviously but um yeah it's it's it, you want it responsive for sure yeah. you don't want to be 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 waiting for your dinner to be get cooked here. right right, right. <laughs> but then out here out here having a super jerky throttle is almost a disadvantage you know like on my x3 it's super sensitive and you know when you're going over rocks and stuff i mean i can i can green key my car eco mode my car put it in rock mode and it'll still be choppy going up over obstacles in low range whereas i've got this pro out there dude it's driving miss daisy like throw anything at it it's perfect (laughs) (laughs) i come from the very i come from a Polaris world where the throttle is very linear it's a very straight line yeah and then he got into the x3 which is very much a hill climb to that throttle right it just pops right up in there yeah um and then a lot of these tunes you know when you go into a full evo you know kit or you go into a, a big turbo kit usually those ramp up pretty fast to give you that thrill ride of that of what you paid for right yeah um you know how does that uh affect your day-to-day i mean you have a dedicated jumping car you have medusa and then you have some other rides kind of how does that compare do you go more linear or um how do you mean more linear like like, like just that <clears> throttle <throat> response because you you've got a built-out pro um, and the pro's throttle response compared to like the old turbos, like the XPs, yeah. uh, is a little bit more aggressive. Uh, but it's a little bit more aggressive, I think, in that like 25 mile plus range versus that lower range. Um, do you mess with that at all on your on your auxiliary cars, or is For that me, kind it's of it's all about clutching? Clutching like in the 16. Yep, yep. You know, I got an older one, so it's all about having an adjustable clutch so you can dial in and get your perfect RPM zone everywhere you go. Right. That's the best way I can control throttle response in, right. in my rig. And you're running a, 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 a standard turbo kit. Yeah, stock turbo yeah. kit, 4R flash. Gotcha. And uh, and you're running the Pro, uh, the Polaris Pro XP uh, two-seater, I believe, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep, and then that's got a that's got an E85 tune in it. Um, it's the thing's fast, like a, another DW DW tune, and it, it's it's very fast. It's that's badass. That's a race car, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you got? Uh, are you going long travel on that or stock 64? Yeah, HDR long travel. Um, it was funny because the Pro came out and <clears throat> they've done such an amazing job with the OEM suspension on the Pro on how it makes it feel like a long travel, but it's not. But um, I just I just needed that long travel, and I'm happy I did because it just turned the 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 car from a beast to a monster you know it's just it's just it's everything you want and more i think the pro is so underrated 
it, it's ridiculous. We were out ripping around with uh, Rock Blocks yesterday, and they have a two seater, and he I don't even think he has his flash stock pretty much bone stock and it just it's exploding sand out here you yeah. know i just i missed my x3 so <laughs> <laughs> ian's uh without an x3 oh, for yeah, a little while it's, as it's, of oregon it's toast pat i won't have it before thanksgiving <laughs> so, yeah yeah it's, it's, it's no out. hurry it's no hurry but yeah. So, um, you know, uh, coming to an event like this, how many events a year are you guys doing? Um, I know you're doing tours you know, of most of the year. Um, and Brandon, I know you're a, lo- no- a local Northwest guy most of the time. Um, what is the what does the summer tour schedule look for you guys? Well, are we talking like before? In a normal year. But be, yeah, before, before or after COVID. Before Rona came and slapped us all in the face. <laughs> Um, I mean, my, my typical year is I'm following UTV Takeover around. Uh, so, you know, minimum four events with them all across all across the country. And then, um, you know, I try to get down to Camp Razor in Glamis. Uh, I, try, I, was gonna, I was supposed to be at SEMA this year. Uh, obviously, that's not happening. And then um, I'm trying to think of what else. There's usually, there's usually three or four smaller events that, that I'm going to try to get to in a year down south. And then there's... Uh, usually two to three Canadian events that we'll, you know, we'll, we'll try to make it to as well. Yeah. So, so I've known, I've known you for about a year and a half, almost two years now, Brandon and I, we've known each other since basically, I, I've known Brandon since I pretty much started marketing into UTV, ran into him real early. But what, one thing I know about you guys is you guys travel really well. I mean, Brandon's wearing a St. Anthony shirt. You're talking about Camp Razor. So if you guys were to talk about some of your favorite riding destinations, because uh, we catch a lot of heat on the show that we focus too much on dunes, too much on Oregon. It's because it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, I mean, we come out to a place like this. I, I'd be really interested to get your guys' takes on uh, where you like to go, uh, maybe maybe off sand. What would be your favorite place, you know, that didn't have sand? I definitely love being out in the mountains. Yeah. Any Anywhere out in the mountains, trees. You both views. are no stranger to the mountains, that's for sure, yeah. 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 Yeah, um, I mean, li- likewise, uh, <clears throat> I live in a real special area where we are because we're right in the middle of all these alpine. We've got Whistler, an hour and a half one way. we got the Coquihalla, an hour and a half the other way. we got Chilliwack, which is 45 minutes one way, and then we got Revelstoke, which is up country a little more. Yeah. Those are some of the biggest stone building mountains in the world. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I live right in the middle of the Cascade Mountain Range. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and so the... The views, the beauty up there, you know, it, it is a hell of a place to take people for a ride. Yeah. Um, just every person that buys a new machine and comes out ripping with us, they're just, they can't put their phones away, you know. Yeah, um, yeah we, we do a Winchester trip in February and getting you to come down for it, you're like, hell no, I'm on tracks, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've done some pretty epic snow yeah. riding uh, this last winter. Uh, how how was that experience going into the tracks and and thrown down? Well, that's the that's like that's now changed the game again for us because now we're getting track systems that actually work, and uh, I'm, I, I'm yeah, and I'm I'm probably going to be designing my own system here fairly soon. It was just with this year got kind of screwed up, but it was supposed to be in production already. Um, it, now we're now we're going places that snowmobiles are going. Before it was like you had to stay on the trail. Well, that was that's why I never really had tracks before because it was kind of boring to me. But now it's like holy shit! Like now we're we're we're, we're getting up eight thousand, nine thousand feet. Wow. We're starting to do high marks. We're starting yeah. to get to glaciers. We're starting to get all this. And so it's just I, I'm like I can't wait to get the tracks back on one of the cars and 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 get rolling again this year because it's just now it's just like the it's like the first time you you grabbed a, a new razor you know it's like all this new stuff so what, what can we do what can we do what can we do you know yeah. um, and, and for reference like uh, how, how far away are you like you're about what maybe a half hour forty five minutes away from like Hope BC yes and and Hope is where the first Rambo movie was filmed for frame of reference, you know? So yeah. <laughs> I think, I think that's about all that went on in hope. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. No shortage, no shortage of snow up in that area. Yeah. I mean, no. we had, you know, the last couple of years, the tracks have really exploded in the market. Um, in the, in our community, the, the track community has really kind of taken off and, uh, those used to be limited quads into the, 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 those lighter weight vehicles. Um, and now we're seeing these bigger, heavier cars get the track systems. Um, they've been traditionally pretty slow. And that's one of the reasons why you can't go up high, right? Yeah. Um, you know, what's what's changing? Are, what kind of things are you seeing 
in the technology of the track systems that that's kind of progressing forward faster. I know Can as a Can uh, Can Am came out with some Apache tracks that is very reminiscent of their um, snowmobiles yeah. uh, track systems, right? Um, and they're snow only. You can't do any kind of dry riding with those. Yeah. Um, kind of what are you seeing and, and looking forward? And I don't want to get into what you're you know keeping under wraps, but um, you know what are you seeing going forward in the track scene? Going forward in the tracks, it's it's, it's about the it's about the flotation. It's about the gearing. You know, the gearing track width, track uh, paddle depth. These are heavy machines. You know, so. Um, you can't just have a bunch of power, but then just be chainsawing through the snow. So we're getting we're getting the the footprint now that's giving us flotation, um, figuring out the as you said the uh, the gear ratios so that you're still actually hauling ass, but you're not burning belts up all, all over the place. And then figuring out the proper paddle and the proper stiffness of paddle, um, so that these big heavy machines aren't just folding them over when they're underneath, but they still got to be light enough to kind of grab that snow. Snow is not anything like sand. Uh, sand you need an aggressive paddle that 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 pushes it through snow you almost need these light little fingers that just kind of uh just kinda gently gently, pull gently you forward, gets yeah. you forward you know um so <clears throat> yeah it's it's coming man i i'm just so stoked that we're out in the places we're at up 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 at these heights now already and like um we're getting into some drops now had, had a few successes had a few non-successes uh <laughs> they, they definitely don't they don't when they got tracks on they don't fly quite with, like they do with wheels but we're getting there <laughs> they take longer to dig out yeah. too yeah. <laughs> brandon you go in that direction here pretty soon you you've, you've, I, you you've know spent once, like once i'll get the system dialed down i do live on a mountain that yeah. uh, is snowmobile access only in the winter other oh, than really? you see a lot of rigs with tracks on yep. them whether that be like you're saying now they have some full-size trucks that are a dry or snow track that they drive right off the mountain i live on and then we go right into town which yeah, is all right. plowed roads and stuff well you guys have in your snow background and stuff uh snowmobiling is no shortage of impact on the utv i mean so it's i mean like yamaha's first motor and it's yxe came out of a sled the uh, clutching systems i mean it's all kind of a trade uh, yeah the cvt clutch yeah yeah so which, the, which helped me when it came to tuning clutches on my Razor because I had already been used to putting yeah. kits on my snowmobile. Yeah, I, I never sledded much as a kid. I was doing MX stuff, and uh, first time I started to get into UTV, I was on a YXE. So then I get into this X3. I'm like, oh, I see what that does. It makes the car go. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. about, that's about the depth of my clutch knowledge. <laughs> there was uh, a couple years ago, uh, I was with the uh, cr the crew from 509, and we went up to a local ski hill where the ski season had shut down for the year, but the, the hill was still covered in, in snow, but it was all packed down a bit. And uh, I took the, the four-seat uh, thousand that I had up there, Razor, and uh, was able to climb all the way to the top of this mountain uh, with big horns on like four PSI, like just epic climb. And then there was no way to do that again. Like you had broken the snow. There was no way of you ever possibly doing that again. One thing you find out real quick is, uh, coming down's the hard part. <laughs> Get, getting up there interesting I so went down the double black diamond on the way back didn't know I did and it was pretty interesting um, but it, it spurred some something in the back of me where it's like I want to do this again at speed with full tr <clears throat> with full traction and be able to see what's capable of these machines because it's a different feeling when you're on when you're floating in the snow and you're and you're carving through the powder and when I was coming down through the double black they had a b bunch of moguls going through there and we were just hitting those trying to stay upright honestly right. <laughs> but but we were hitting them and, and you were getting that carving feeling you were getting a rhythm down it was like that was one of the most epic feelings i've had i mean it's very similar to carving a good dune session where you're cut, cutting in and out of bowls and over lips and all that kind of stuff and i'm i'm sure you had that experience this last winter with what you were doing um i i can't wait till that gets to a point where we can all start gathering up in the mountains and having campfires and like freaking sending them. Yeah, for sure. 100%. The funny thing was is, uh, I accidentally bought the snowmobile, not accidentally, but I bought, <laughs> I bought the snowmobile that has that Z1 1100 turbo engine in it that oh. everybody's putting in their side-by-sides. Right. So, I mean, I went big power right out of the gate. Nice. nice. That's awesome. You should I think we maybe throw that in your chassis. Yeah, it might be going <laughs> in. That's, it's, that's why it's still sitting in the driveway. Gotcha. Al, I got a question. Um, so most of the riding that I do is up in the mountains and like where Brandon's from, I, I haven't explored that nearly as much as I want to, but it's a real open area where you got a bunch of forest service roads and a bunch of other trails that all connect to each other. Yeah, and we'll have I mean, to hook something up. Yeah, I mean, like you, you know as well as anybody, like out of Leavenworth, you could probably disappear, cover 
cover trails for hundreds a month, and, hundreds. and you oh, yeah. never get to even 50 percent is that kind of how bc is because i've seen some footage like there's this youtube channel that's just popped up recently called the story until now uh dude is literally your neighbor like he's real close to you and he's in a patriot and he's like this overlander wheeler guy oh yeah and he's taken that thing in places where i'm just like this stupid freaking virus man <laughs> i <laughs> go right up there so bad i've heard epic but, stories about the area yeah, up there it How just looks oh, unreal yeah. no it, it, it is literally endless um yeah, the, the Coquihalla, I would say that zone is the, it has the most, you have the most opportunity to go out from there, like to, like to start. Uh, when you get into the, the big mountains and Whistler and stuff like that, it, the trails do end, you know, uh, you get some epic views, but the trails do end until the snow hits. And then that's what I mean. Then it just becomes endless wow um but uh, yeah you can definitely you, you can spend overnight you can you can you can ride for a long time you know your, your biggest uh your biggest uh factor is fuel at, at that point you know how you're how you're getting fuel to the next stop because when you're when you're out in these trails you ain't, you ain't buy no no gas station <laughs> it's, it's, right, you're, sure. you're way out there and i i caught people i laugh because <clears throat> every now and then i'll post a picture of the four-seater uh and we i have fuel racks on all my cars especially the snow car because we, we run through a lot of fuel and they're like i can't believe you're you're running fuel on your on your cars and i'm just like man we're you we're, we're not from. coming home yeah you ain't coming <laughs> home you know and that's why that's why walking negative 20 for sure <clears throat> that's why we've made fuel racks that actually fit the fuel cans in and don't fall over so we can be safe and and run fuel yeah yeah so are you running uh poly packs or are you running uh steel cans what are you running no we run um like a like a vp style square racing can 20 yep. 20 liters five gallons a piece and we run two of those in the back um square <clears throat> when i'm uh when i'm on snow tracks i'll go through three tanks of fuel in four hours right like, like uh snow it, kills your fuel <clears throat> mileage for sure it, it's getting to the point where, uh, like, I'm having to get helicopter drops up top so wow. that we can actually keep going. You know, wow. so yeah, fuel's a fuel's a real thing. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're set up. I know I know what you're talking about in terms of storing that gas in the back of that thing. And I, your setup is so clean. I was I saw it, uh, a picture of it within the last three to four months. I actually snapped snaps a screenshot out of it. And <laughs> when my car went in to get built, I'm like, can you do that? <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're uh, here uh, through the rest of the week. You guys have um, – there's no Wheelie Fest at this uh, event, uh, Not unfortunately. This year. Hopefully next year. But uh, there is going to be a Huck Fest. Uh, right, and- Steve? Next year. <laughs> Everybody look at Steve. <laughs> um, but uh, Saturday is the big event, right? We're going to be doing a throwdown at, at the jump and throwing some hucks. And um, I know, Brandon, you had some issues with your car. Have, have you rectified that situation yet? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's definitely a blown motor. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> so you rectified it by yeah. finding out what was wrong with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, fortunately for me, uh, Octane Toy Box Rich Maxi uh, sent me down here with his NA car to uh, help support and raise awareness for his son who has Dravet syndrome. If anybody would like to look into that, that's Dravet yep. Syndrome Foundation uh, UTV 316. Yeah, you guys have both been involved in that a little bit, if I remember right. Yeah, uh, uh, for those who don't know, yeah, Dravet Al actually like, built yeah. the car. Dravet is like a, a permanent form of epilepsy that comes on when kids are super, super young, and yeah, yeah, uh, it's very unfortunate. But so we're down here. Um, I do have the the NA car, no turbo, so uh, we're gonna. We're just going to send it for everything she's got. Nice. <laughs> but it's fast, and it's ironic because that's that car that he's jumping that we you know, sold to Rich and got him going with that program with is a car I broke the first world record in. Oh, really? That's so, the car? Yeah. So oh, wow. um, it's, uh, it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the car is definitely dialed. Oh, yeah. Probably and the most fun car I've ever jumped so far. Yeah. Just the way it reacts and the way he took it from a two-seater to a single-seat center how, drive how much weight do you think was shaved on that car over the time? it's yeah. light that, that car is extremely light yeah because um, i you know you know rich is my size and i was watching him rip it around coos bay uh the first, right after he got it and he pulled up to me i'm like i can't believe that thing's not a turbo that thing just rips man <laughs> it's pretty yeah. epic i it's, I, it's I wish i could I kind of emulate like i was talking to you before we started recording you know, how i've always wanted to have uh, a slimmed down car with one seat like that it just seems like such a great connection to the car and a, and a new way of driving that it just seems so natural yeah um, is, it, especially is it an racing. easier car to drive than a, your uh, 16 it's more comfortable yeah. um, right with the center seat and it's so low down in the car your center of gravity is so low you don't get nearly the body roll yeah. you do out of like a stock 
two seater. Does it affect like like it like vi- visually when you're in there? Do you feel like you're choosing better lines and stuff like that? Like basically, what I'm asking is, is that the way it should be done? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely feel much more comfortable running that car. Like yeah. I, I never knew anything other than my two seater until I started running that car this summer um, and racing, trying to raise awareness for those guys. Um, and it was like I get out of that car and back into mine. And it was it, it's night and day difference. Yeah, for sure. It, it's it's for me. It's it's the comfort. A lot of people. A lot of people when they saw me like start building the jump cars. Well, I guess I, if I forgot when I was talking to you. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. We built that one too. So it's 2015. We started building center seats, and um, it everyone's like, oh, he's doing that because then his weights in the middle and it helps the car out. Jumping doesn't work like that. It doesn't matter where your weight is. Um, but it's just so much more comfortable. Um, you're not banging, you know, you're not banging your elbows. You're just, you've, you've got this set up and you're more comfortable in it. And, and when you're, com- when you're comfortable, you're concentrating on the, on the task at hand. Nice. Have you ever uh, driven in the RS1 platform? I have. I have. And how does that compare to the modified chassis that you're running versus a stock production car that is kind of on the same lines? The RS1 is awesome. Um, uh, the, the comfort is even better than what I've got going on um, because either they've actually got their pedal placement perfect. I've got to do a little, a little uh, uh, heel shift on, <laughs> yeah, on, yeah. On, on what I got going. There's on. a drive but, line in the way. Yeah, but um, but no, it's the RS one's a badass. Um, it's they, they've made a great little car. Um, the reason that you're not seeing me in an RS one is because it's it's not a turbo car. Um, but um, no, I, I I was racing uh, the RS ones in uh, uh, Minnesota at a, a Polaris event down there and it was it was uh, uh it was pretty fun man it was <laughs> we um we I, re- I think i remember that one was that that one that uh uh they had a whole bunch of influencers out yeah that was cool yeah it right was on. super cool we yeah. uh recently interviewed George hamill from the dirt life show uh who wrecked pretty something fierce at last last year's utp worlds uh and went back this year with an rs1 platform where he's used to racing yxz's and um 1000s uh two seaters and stuff like that and he was talking about how it was a completely different world getting into that one seater center center line and all that stuff and I, I just think that's such an awesome car and I, just, I think it's undersold i think people just overlook it a lot because they have families agree. or passengers or whatever but just if you can get if you can afford to be into a car where you can have the one seat i it seems to me like just a no-brainer so big event saturday um you're going to be participating in the in the contest long jump contest right i'm going to do the the hawk fest i'm going to do the short course racing and i'll do the rally fest race and rally fest i don't really i haven't heard anything about exactly how that's set up is it just um like a short course race or is it something a little bit modified it's kind of it's definitely modified from the short course the short course setup they have is a 60 40 split on the track that you race somebody at the same time right and i believe the rally fest is going to be like a two mile loop timed that's killer and it's going to go over the sand the rocks uh, you're going to get a little so bit of everything race. except for the uh unlike the short course is all on sand gotcha are you both running that yep cool yeah and uh you're going to be doing uh you said you were to do some of the racing uh today and tomorrow um, tomorrow and the next day, yeah, same same thing. Short course and rally course. Those are my two. Those are my two. You know, races of choice to do, and then um, and then we'll be doing an exhibition jump on on Saturday. I heard you uh, are gonna send it big. This, uh, I mean, we say that every time, right? But uh, <laughs> I heard there's a little bit of a grudge match on the jump uh, this year. Well, there's a there's a, a mound being built behind us. I don't know if you can see it, but <laughs> it's Mount Al, <laughs> <laughs> Mount Macbeth. Mount Macbeth. Oh, oh, and, and again, we don't want to confuse what I'm doing with 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 the uh, with the um, with the competition either, right? I, I'm just doing an exhibition jump. That's kind of what I'll be doing from now on. I'm not going to be actually competing in in, in the jump contest anymore um we're just which guys like me appreciate (laughs) (laughs) i'm just i'm setting up a jump to go a certain distance and that's you know that's what we're going to be doing um are we going to hit records every single every single event probably not you know that's not a realistic way to think but um we're always going to be setting stuff up so that there's a potential for a you know the next record for the next event um yeah, it's going to be a good time, man. I'm always, uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to see uh, again. Props to YouTube Takeover to be building me this, building the stuff for me. Yeah, Rob's an animal on that dozer. Nice. Him and his whole crew. Nice, great people. So they they travel with the show, right? They're doing all that stuff Correct. at each show. And so, I mean, it's a learning curve for all of us, including the dozer people, especially when we come to new areas like this. Because, like I was saying, we've never built jumps in the sand. 
like this. Do you guys use those guys for insight? Like when they're pushing the dirt, they have some feedback that they can provide? Or, or is it pretty, you kind yeah. of get the information yourself, kind of know what you're dealing with? Well, or? we get to watch the different layers of sand yeah. and where the moisture's at and how it's moving around off of the dozer right for on. sure. And whether it's packing or sloughing off. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm still kind of blown away by the sand out here. It's really heavy. It's like I was, I was but walking. But it's so fine at the same I know, time. It's slippery. It just I falls I was, on itself, I was walking right? uphill, and I just wanted to fight someone. It sucked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We were out filming uh, yesterday a little bit with uh, the cars, and, and I was on the side of the dunes. Yeah, and you were huffing and puffing, bud. <laughs> it was funny. You get like four or five steps, and you're like, oh, I'm making good progression here. And then you get to the last five feet of the dune, and you're just like, it took me 10 minutes to go five <laughs> feet. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every step you take, you slide back an extra foot. Yeah. So it uh, looks like it's going to be a good event. Hopefully everybody um, gets out of their homes and, and gets out and breathes some fresh air and gets rid of that Rona out of their breath and um, uh, can come enjoy what Mother Nature's given us out here. This is a pretty epic place. I've never been to somewhere like this that has such a ver- variety of things to do. Yeah, yeah this, this, beautiful is, country. this is mind-blowing, this place. We, we went for a good tour yesterday, and uh, wow, you know. Bring a camera. For sure. For <laughs> it's, sure. It's something to be seen, yeah, for sure. I haven't felt that much like a tourist in a long time. No, for <laughs> sure. I, li- I live in a tourist <laughs> town, right, so yeah, I try to right. keep the tourism on a DL. Somebody right. made a comment that uh, there's a trail system to the south here that will link into uh, Grant, uh, uh, the Grand, Grand Canyon. Canyon. Wow. Yeah. That would yeah. be interesting. That would be right. It definitely goes a long ways. Once you get up to the top, uh, back over here, and you actually get a view of what this place has to offer, it's, it's nuts. just amazing. The yeah. trails seem endless. Yeah. I think we might have to see about planning a trip to the Grand Canyon one of these days. I don't know. I mean, you get back there a ways and see those dune bulls. I, uh, <laughs> They're like a I, magnet to I, Chad. I, so. I kind of have a squirrel moment. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I can't uh, wait to see you guys rip it. We're going to be out shooting some uh, shots of you guys and, and everybody else out competing and having a good time. And, again, props to the uh, Steve and Jim for putting on an amazing show. Uh, this is one of the few events every year that people can go to and participate in and not just do the typical you know trade show donut and then grab your beer and go yeah um it I, also I really doesn't cost you an arm and a leg to get into the events for sure a, exactly. lot, of, a lot of these events you know they uh charge a lot of money to keep some of the the people out right you know right right and i i think it's just the this kind of model is just the model to have and i think that this kind of event is really where it, uh, the community thrives oh yeah. they've they've created a great environment for everybody well, if you guys wouldn't mind, maybe uh, shout it out on what, what's your guys' handles and stuff. How can people get a Where can we check find out you? How can we support you? And, and uh, who's uh, supporting you guys? Like Instagram, stuff like that. Yeah, my, uh, my IG handle is uh, sickwitit all day. Um, I'm on Facebook, Brandon <laughs> Raddick. Uh, I get huge support from uh, the Metal Havoc crew. Uh, Metal Havoc Motorsports are great people. Sandcraft RCR. Uh, Full throttle battery. Full throttle battery. Yeah. I'm working on getting there. I'm getting there. These guys, uh, yeah, full throttle definitely keeps the car juiced up. I ain't got to uh, uh, worry about a lack of energy in the car, that's for sure. Uh, uh, concept distributing. These guys keep me uh, uh, pushing pushing the limits, for sure. Octane Toy Box. Great people. Addiction Power Sports. Why do we say Rich Maxey's name every podcast? He's everywhere. He's a, he's a great man. He's everywhere. He's, he's a, a good, great, man. great guy. Great family. Yeah. Find me yeah. a guy that doesn't get along. If you if you can't get along with Rich, you got a you problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally. for sure. Yeah. So Al, where can we find you online, and, and how can we support you? Um, Instagram, uh, Al, Al Macbeth three fifty seven. Uh, Facebook, I got a page and uh, and a personal account. All Al Macbeth. Um, and yeah, I, I'm Polaris Razor sponsored guy, Concept Distributing, uh, Marlon Products, um, Simpson Rays Products, been keeping me safe almost since we began this. That was super super cool to work with those guys as well. Uh, Fuel UTV keeps the tires on my cars. Baja Designs Officials keeps me riding at night. Uh, HCR Racing, we got on with them this year with some long travel kits and very impressed. Very, very, very impressed as well. I'll say about them. Uh, Sector 7 Zone, uh, Walker Evans Racing, High Roller Energy Drink. And then we also got <laughs> Sandcraft Razor. Uh, they got me some, got me onto their tires actually last year, okay. and they jumped on board this year. And um, there ain't nothing like them. I, I, I got to say that uh, Rebel Style Customs, DW Performance, keeping the keeping the power in the cars, keeping them tuned right, and um, Warfighter Made and UTV Takeover. Rad uh, Takeover San Hollow 2020. 
It's going to be epic. Can't wait to see you guys, and we'll throw some video and clips into everything, and uh, we'll be pushing your content as soon as we get it done. Right on, guys. Thanks, Thanks for having for us on. Thanks for uh, joining us. Guys. Yeah, rock and roll. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Peace. How are we going, guys? <laughs>